Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Mike Manfra from Purdue University uh, present today's seminar. Um, Mike Manfra, uh, Mike is currently the uh, Bill and E. O'Brien Professor of Business and Astronomy so, uh, at, at Purdue University. Um, he, uh, he, he, he got his uh, AB in physics from Harvard in 92, PhD in uh, 1999, and then he was at Bell Labs for a couple of years. And then in 2009, he started in Purdue University. Mike is actually one of these, um, uh, I would say rare, uh, maybe, maybe becoming less rare now, combinations of MBE growth and trans and quantum transport. Usually, somehow traditionally, th these were quite separate um, back in the day. Um, and for the, I've, I've come to know Mike uh, uh, for the past couple of years, uh, to a large extent, because he became interested in Majorana nanowires and uh, grown in quantum wells. And so that was, um, and then he's, he's been basically the, the guy who makes the material for the Microsoft experiments um, that have been going on for, for at least for the last few years. Um, and that's, Zoom that's switch, um, which screen was. And again, ultimately, a, a, a big part of quantum, oh, of the Zoom ability to switch, do quantum computing switch. in solid state relies on the material being per, almost perfect. Um, as we were discussing, this topological robustness is a little bit of a myth. Um, so, uh, and, but on the other side, Mike is also like a quantum hall that, uh, like, he's also been one of the main protagonists in the quantum hall and fractional quantum hall interferometry arena. And actually, most recently, his most exciting thing, unfortunately, is not Majorana's in Microsoft, but rather uh, having made enormous progress in being able to see any unbraiding, which has kind of been a holy grail in condensed matter for a few decades. 40. 40 years. decades. Uh, yeah. 40 so, years. Yeah. And, uh, 40 years. 40 years, <laughs> four decades. And uh, we've been looking for this for a while. and. <laughs> it's uh, unfortunately taken a ridiculously long time. Not 40 decades, but a ridiculously <laughs> long time. All right, so with that, I'll let Mike tell you the real story. Okay, thanks, sir. Thanks yeah. for the introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be here uh, at Maryland and have the opportunity to tell you about some of our uh, experiments over the last few years uh, that we think at this stage of development um, give strong evidence for anionic braiding statistics of uh, fractionally charged quasi-particles in the quantum Hall regime. <clears throat> okay, let's make sure. Okay, you... Click on the screen once. Uh, what do I do? Just... Just click on it, and then the clicker should be back. Right. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. Good, good, good. So um, let me start off by saying that, as was just alluded to, the theoretical notion that certain excitations in low dimensional systems may be uh, fractionalized, have fraction of a, uh, electron charge and fractional statistics, something that interpolates between bosons and fermions has been uh, developed over many decades. Uh, the earliest that I'm aware of goes back to the late seventies work from mathematical physicists, uh, Lenas and, and Merheim, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing their names properly, or Scandinavian. Uh, and there were others uh, that contributed, but really there was the first to realize that in reduced dimensional systems, bo uh, bosons and fermions aren't the only possibility. You could have uh, something that interpolates in between, uh, and there's more exotic examples as well, uh, having non-abelian statistics. Now, where this really took off I think in the condensed matter community was with the work of uh, Wilczek. And, uh, and that is amazing coincidence how his theoretical work in considering uh, model Hamiltonians coincided with the advent of the fractional quantum Hall effect being discovered in real samples in gallium arsenide at Bell Laboratories. And, and I'll, I'll try to show you this a little bit uh, now, but numerous people, theoretical, uh, Theorists and theoretical works have contributed to our current understanding of fractionalization in a reduced dimensional system. So where it really gets going, I think, 
is uh, with this paper from Frank Wilczek. And this is basically where the anion is defined. And it's a pun, right? It's a joke. It, they can have any statistic, so we call it an anion. And what was really sort of prescient about this was in the model he was considering, he was considering charged particles tied to vortices, composite objects where you have uh, a charged particle and, and it's tied to a vortice and it uh, lives in two plus one dimensions. And the statistics, uh, what he found out is the if you look at the uh, angular momentum of, of such objects, so that you can be fractional. And, and since we, we know the connection between the spin statistics theorem, uh, the statistics of these objects interpolates between that of bosons and, and fermions. Now, again, this is a toy model that he just worked out essentially the two particle quantum mechanics of. Um, but I think it's, it's really interesting to look back now with hindsight. He says, although practical applications of these phenomena seem remote, they have considerable methodological interest and shed light on the fundamental spin statistics connection. Note the date, it's June, 1982. Uh, the first observation of the fractional effect was in late 81 by Stormer, Sui, and Gosser. And there was a flurry of uh, theoretical activity trying to explain quantization at fractional filling, of course, coming in, in Laughlin's famous paper, Wave Function. Shortly thereafter, though, Bert Halperin was trying to develop and explain the daughter states. If there's first the one third state, and then there was sort of a proliferation of new states being discovered. And in an attempt to, to describe this hierarchy, he came across that if you worked out the statistics of the quasi particles. Now, if you're not familiar, in Laughlin's seminal paper, he described that the excitation is a quantum liquid of fractionally charged quasi particles. So Laughlin had told us that it was going, the excitations were going to be quantized, the charge is going to be quantized for the one third state and one third E. But shortly thereafter, Halperin noticed that the statistics would also be fractionalized. And it's kind of interesting. He says the appearance of fractional statistics in the present context is strongly reminiscent of the ideas introduced by Wilczek to describe charged particles tied to magnetic flux tubes in two dimensions. Now, this was <clears throat> in the early 80s before the advent of composite fermion theory and all that we know now and have learned and take for granted. So uh, considering these toy models of charged particles tied to vortices uh, <clears throat> back in these days, uh, it seems rather inspired uh, 40 years later. And of course, there was others who put this on a little bit more firm theoretical ground uh, Rova, Schrieffer, and Wilczek, again, um, considered the problem of statistics using an analysis that we familiar modern students of condensed matter, <laughs> essentially calculating berry phase if you drag one quasi particle around the other, and, and also concluded that the statistics must be fractional. Mike, uh, I just have more comments. Oh, no. Going it, deep into the <laughs> history. Uh, that sentence by Wilczek, I mean, it might also be worth noting that it's technically wrong. It cannot, the statistics cannot take any continuous value. They can only take rational values. And that's like one of the okay. key important things about the theory that is like not clear. Okay. Okay. Fair. <laughs> I'm not offended. I will, I will call Frank and tell him that, that he needs to publish a correction. <laughs> I'm sure he will oblige. You could imagine that the word fractional in there. In fact, uh, uh, embraced the idea that it should be uh, a rational though. Does he practice? This has nothing to do with experiments. I'm not talking about experiments, but I, I, I accept your point. <laughs> okay. Now, I am going to talk about the fractional palm hall effect and specifically in Galley Marcinite structures. And this is because this is the most well-developed system we have in condensed matter for actually building very complicated devices and uh, controlling uh, their dynamics. And, but by no means, I wanna give the impression that this, this is a, the only system in which this interesting physics may happen, okay? And it's, from my perspective, a very exciting time in condensed matter physics. There are many systems where anions, I will be found, uh, you know, if we can find the proper, Candidate quantum spin liquid material, of course, as Jay was alluding to, there's a host of work searching for topological superconductors, both intrinsic 
and the type I work on, the engineered type in hybrid systems. And there's really exciting work going on um, in the vendor walls materials, specifically uh, in the rhombohedral quintuple layer graphene. This is uh, work out of Zhu's group where they're seeing pretty good evidence for a fractional quantum novel's Hall effect. So while I'm talking about a system in Galley Mars and I, uh, it, this physics, I think, will be found in many systems. It's just that we have a great deal of control over the one I work in and therefore can probe it uh, with a fairly good resolution. Okay. And so if I've excluded your favorite system, please don't be offended. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing more results. And I am also going to talk primarily about interferometric measurements. And, you know, these happen first in, in Galley Marsnai, but recent really exciting work out of Philip Kim's group and Andrea Young out of UCSB are building similar uh, interferometers in graphene now. And so there's, uh, you know, a lot of activity in this field. So I, I should have told you that um, Andrea is talking tomorrow at the colloquium. Oh, he gets invited to the colloquium. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> this, is the king, this is the real deal. Right? This is the king of quantum institute. This, right? this, this is a seminar has a bigger attendance than the first. I'm just kidding. I'm like, I'll tell you what. It's okay. Like a <laughs> and we got Bill here. Well, yeah, that's right. right. I, I mean, the fact that you showed up is right. <laughs> enough for me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyhow, Andrea's, I'm collaborating with Andrea on some projects, and he has some really, really nice stuff. And it's just an exciting time. But I'm going to talk about fractional quantum Hall effect in the old standard alum galley marsonite, galley marsonite. And here's why. This is magnetotransport at low temperature in a dilution refrigerator, relatively low density. Uh, for those, the uninitiated, if there are any, um, the blue trace is the Hall voltage, the Hall resistance. And of course, classically, you know, this should be a straight line proportional to magnetic field and inversely proportional to the density of carriers in the 2D layer. Of course, that linearity is punctuated by these extremely flat and well-quantized plateaus occurring both at the integer uh, uh, quantum Hall effect, where you see the filling factor one, two, whatever, the filling factor corresponds to the ratio of the density of electrons in the 2D layer to the number of flux quanta piercing the 2D layer. So at nu equals one, I can match up exactly one electron per flux quantum. At two, I have two electrons per flux quantum. Now, of course, the phenomenology at fractional filling looks exactly the same. You can't tell much is different by just looking at the magnetotransport, but of course they have quite different origins. Now, the longitudinal resistance in, in this regime and the level of samples we have now is basically uh, zero resistance for, for uh, most of the time, punctuated by spikes of resistance when we go into uh, compressible states. Now, for people who are experts, you know, uh, we can zoom in. If you're interested in composite fermion wiggleology, you can look around U equals three halves and just see, uh, you know, you can count them until the cows come home, how many fractions there are. If you're interested in uh, putative non-abelian states, here's five halves in extremely low magnetic field. Not quite zero magnetic field yet, but not high. And this is uh, a state that is presumably hosting non-abelian areas. Now, the excitations of this fractional quantum Hall effect are uh, theoretically conjectured to have fractional charge and statistics. That was the fractional charge was a fundamental tenant of Laughlin's original proposal. But uh, you know, he he said this in in '83 as an explanation for the quantized plateau. But I want to mention that it was nearly 15 years till the Weizmann group, Mori Heidelin's group, and the Sapple group uh, were able to advance quantum shot noise measurements sufficiently and samples sufficiently to actually verify that in the experiment. So, you know, sometimes theorists will say, well, the very fact that you see a quantized plateau at one third means that you have fractional charge and fractional statistics. Yeah, maybe sort of. But actually seeing it in an experiment. Uh, is another matter altogether. And the anionic gradient statistics for the uh, Laughlin states, the statistical phase is given by 2 pi times the ratio of the effective charge to the bare electron charge, again, was known in the earliest days of the quantum fractional quantum Hall effect, the 80s. But I'm giving you a talk 
about it now in 2024. So there must have been some delay there too. Just so everyone's clear, what I mean by uh, statistics, I'm considering this little model system where these little spirals represent localized excitation, quasi particles. And if I take one around the other, that's equivalent to two exchanges. I bring one around each other. You would think that nothing interesting can happen. I bring the state back to its original <clears throat> configuration. So there can't be any memory of this or, or knowledge that I have done this. But yet for these anions, <clears throat> the effective wave function builds up a non-trivial phase given by two pi e star over e. And for the state, I'll primarily talk about nu equals one third. This corresponds to two pi over three. So if you've got number in mind when we actually start looking at data, I should see an anion phase of two pi over three. Okay. Now, I can understand why uh, you would be reluctant to say that just the observation of a fractional plateau uh, says that there's fractional statistics. Why are you reluctant to say that it shows there's fractional charge? Uh, it's a strong, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you consider the is basically spectroscopy of charge, then the plateau uh, does say. It, it, it is a necessary condition, but what I'm... But is it sufficient? <laughs> what, I, what I'm... I, I, I'm not one... Or I'm not sure if I'm skilled enough to uh, make that argument. What I, The argument I'm trying to make is that actually probing something in an experiment, the, 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 the bulk conductivities are a macroscopic quantity. You measure voltage, you drive a current and measure voltages. That you're not measuring anything microscopic. Your average, you know, transport measure is averaging over a distribution. So the fact that it's quantized and, and we have the, these, you know, that the Hall connectivity is a topological invariant, that all goes to this point you're saying. I just mean that seeing something uh, at a more granular level is not the same as seeing it in a, what essentially is an average quantity. That's all. Um, now, and I will say that the prize, something you're familiar with, 1998 for Stormer, Sui, and Laughlin, in the write-up for that, they, they, you know, they, they talk about the shot noise measurements as, as an important part of confirmation of the underlying theory. So, you know, the, the shot noise experiments were an important aspect of, you know, solidifying the entire edifice of the, of the theory, is what I would say. Okay. Uh, now, the question comes up a lot now, well, why does this take so long? Is, is, why can't you just do it? And what it turns out to be is, uh, in, you know, to measure things in devices, a lot of things have to fall in place. It has to be, the header structure has to be designed and grown properly. There is mesoscopic uh, device fabrication that has to be worked out and then there's electrical measurements. And all of these have to fall in place in order to you know, conclude that you've made an observation. And that just takes time. It takes time and in innovative experiments by other groups and learnings and building up. And so it from my you know, from my view, getting all these things to work together was our contribution um, to building on earlier experiments. Okay. So what I'm going to try to convince you of in the time remaining is that Fabry Pro interferometry the electronic analog of a fabric, optical fabric probe in front of allows us to directly observe anionic rating statistics. And this was built up in a series of experiments starting back in 2019, when we first figured out how to uh, design a proper heterostructure that allows us to, um, what I would say is get beyond obfuscating mesoscopic physics effects and get at the core of measuring the fractional statistics. Uh, it, we designed a new header structure and a new device that overcame some challenges that were found in the field. And this was really key. This allowed us to get into what I'm gonna describe as the Aronoff Bohm regime. Then in 2020, we redesigned the samples and, and were able to measure discrete phase slips in the interference pattern consistent with an anionic phase of two pi over three, okay? So what do I mean that I'm looking at a Fabry-Pro interferometer with fractionally charged quasi-particles? 
Well, the blue region considered uh, in this cartoon the two-dimensional electron gas. The yellow lines and T's, those are surface gates. They're used to locally deplete the 2D electron gas underneath, um, under the gate. And they define the interference chamber. Now we have source and drain contacts. We also have lots of voltage probes, but this is the general idea. And we apply a perpendicular magnetic field. So the surface gates define the electron interference path. These two gates that come together in a narrow constriction are referred to as quantum point contacts. They serve as the electronic analog of a beam splitter. They act to partition the edge states. So if you're not familiar with um, this type of physics, in the, in the quantum Hall regime, current is primarily carried by uh, chiral edge modes that circulate around the periphery of the device. So the edge mode comes into the first QPC. It is partially backscattered, going from the lower edge to the, uh, uh, the edge that it, it chiral, so it's returning back to the source. We control this amount of backscattering through the voltages. Most of the current propagates through the interior of the interferometer. We again partially backscatter some of it to form the interior interference loop. And so it's the current that circulates around the interior of the interferometer and then recombines with the current that was initially backscattered at the first QPC that dictates the interference. And most of the current though, of course, travels onto the drain. And the modulations as a function of system parameters of the drain current is what we actually measure. So the current that comes out <coughs> is proportional to the transmission uh, matrix element squared of the first QPC, the transmission coefficient, that's obvious. The second transmission coefficient that also comes in. That is, again, how much we siphon off to go through the interferometer. But then there's this cross term that varies, varies as a cosine. And this cosine theta here, the theta is the interference phase. It's not the anionic phase. It's just the, the phase difference between the path taken around the loop and the one that was originally backscattered. Okay, so <clears throat> if this are if we're dealing with the integer quantum Hall effect and they're just boring ordinary electrons, the phase that develops is nothing but the Arona Bohm phase. It's proportional to the area of the chamber times the magnetic field that penetrates out of the page and is periodic in the magnetic flux quantum. Magnetic flux quantum is H over E. Okay, so we can measure the interference by measuring the electrical conductance across this device, basically how the drain current is modulated. And we operate it by either changing the magnetic field or these T gates, those are the plunges. If you think of it as an accordion, I have this chamber that can squeeze and open and squeeze and change the area. And I will see periodic changes in the phase that develops by um, tuning these two parameters. So, if you think about it, lines of negative slope of constant phase should be expected in a 2D color plot where you have magnetic field variation on the x-axis and gate voltage variation on the y-axis. And you think about what you have to do to maintain constant phase. If I squeeze it down in order to have the same amount of flux, I have to increase the magnetic field. Conversely, if I open it up uh, by changing the gate voltage, you have to have a concomitant change a magnetic field to keep the to keep the phase the same. So theoretically, this is what you should expect in the boring integer regime. Lines of constant phase forming this barbershop pole-like uh, lines here with negative slope. The, the red and blue regions are just areas of constant phase. On the x-axis is the properly normalized magnetic field, and on the y-axis is the side gate or plunger voltage. And this theory, Again, I should also note, theory was way ahead of experiment. You know, Shimon, Gilson, Sandy, Wen had this basically worked out in the late 90s. And there's a cartoon and a picture of just do this, and you can measure all these properties. You can measure fractional charge, you can measure fractional statistics, you can measure lodging or liquid parameters, everything. That's a prescription of what to do. The only problem is you can't do what their cartoon says. So more detailed calculations of real messages devices were carried out by many, many people. I'm highlighting one here by Bert Helper and Stern, Rosenauer. Um, anyway, there's lots of people who contrib contributed. Now, 
What happens if we move from the integer regime where our charge carriers are in principle uh, bare electrons to the fractional regime where the charge carriers are fractionally charged lawful and quasi particles with fractional charge and fractional statistics? And I've localized one here in my little cartoon with this spiral. And before you go there, Absolutely. I, I want to ask about um, something that I'm trying to figure out whether it's important or not. You've called this a fabric Perel, which sure looks a lot more like a mock center to me. And um, uh, and the reason why I think it's important is that a fabric Perel wouldn't have an enclosed area. Where no, but this has multiple, the, the distinction we're making, it, it is a uh, non pers I would say, not completely rigorous distinction. And why we're calling it here is there are multiple uh, interference paths. It can multiple times. The Mach Zender is one yeah. going out. Whereas here, in principle, if the coherence is high enough, I can have multiple loops. And the actual interference phase is a summation of these various terms. That's the distinction that's made. You can build Mach Zenders, electronic Mach Zenders, but they don't have you know, it's the, the beam is split and it goes to different uh, different drains at the end. If you want, I, I can right, but show it does you. have area. This this thing has area. Yes. It would be more like Sanyang. Yeah, that sounds if, okay. If, if I want to put, uh, yeah, I, I'm not an optics expert, so I'm Sanyang. sure you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is this is the uh, the language that exists in the literature. Okay. I, I didn't uh, come so up with it. another comment for Bill. It's because the finesse is 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 not one. There are a bunch of mammals, but it would be like it's yeah. Sanyak. It's not one, it's a summation of many paths, and that's why at least the condensed matter theory is called a fabric bro. Yeah. She's not <laughs> yes. <laughs> Send all your complaints to the theory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, it's we'll check, you know, we've got to line them up. <laughs> <laughs> <Or help> run. <laughs> okay, so this is what we call it. Anyway. What the difference in the fractional regime is, is, is twofold. One, that this AB phase that I'm talking about gets renormalized, scaled by the effective charge. So if we see a change in periodicity that corresponds, you know, that is associated with the effective charge. And note now that the interference phase is uh, directly uh, dependent on the number of localized quasi particles and the anionic phase itself. So if I have a chamber, I can only change the number of quasi-particles discreetly. I can add or remove one. So if NL changes by plus minus one, what you would see is a, uh, a essentially almost discontinuous phase slip. That's what we should expect. It's not completely discontinuous due to a finite temperature, all sorts of things, but you'll see glitches in the data. That's the expectation. Okay. Why is it bad? Excuse me? Why is there no dynamical phase? Uh, dynamical phase as opposed to just a uh, due to just uh, the electron uh, evolving on the dynamic chain. I, I don't think, yeah, I, I just rings from the, the, the potential. Yeah. The energy. Uh, I think in the analysis that actually falls out. Uh, I'll have to, I don't have a great answer for you right now. Um, but the analysis of the interference phase and the phase differences that uh, does not seem to depend on that. Isn't that kind of included in the gauge? I mean, the mass and I mean, this is the, the actual interference phase, yeah. right? And what we're saying here, at least, is that there's two main contributions to it. So, Is there, a, is there a theoretical quandary? I don't know. I, yeah, I, I think it's probably an overall shift of this. From, but, but anyway. Yeah, but that wouldn't show up in, if there's an overall constant. It wouldn't necessarily be visible in the experiment. Exactly. Yeah, so, so I don't think it's relevant. Yeah. OK. Um, now, this is what you should expect. And then phase glitches, if you add or remove a quasi-particle, but reality turns out to be a lot more complicated. What actually happens, these devices are not optical systems. They're not photons where it don't interact. These are electrons and charges. And so there's a Coulomb potential between 
uh, these excitations. And what I've been describing as an interferometer, uh, I could call it something else, a quantum dot, where we know all the machinery of quantum dot physics. So what Bert and others have worked out in gory detail is that depending on the coupling constants, you can get a variety of behaviors. You can be in this limit of the non-interacting interferometer, if you want to call it the photon limit, where you just get these nice AB lines with negative slope. But as you start introducing coupling, coupling between charges in the interior, the bulk of the incompressible state, and the gapless modes at the edge, depending on the strength, you can get all sorts of terms uh, contributing to the conductance. And so what happens is if the Coulomb uh, interactions are sufficiently strong, you go into this Coulomb dominated regime where what you call essentially interference is completely flipped from the AB case and you have lines of constant phase with positive slope. Now, the important point for our discussion is in this Coulomb dominated regime, in principle, you are insensitive to the anionic phase. So essentially, every time a quasi particle is introduced, it, it comes with a two pi uh, accompanying phase, which of course is not uh, visible in the experiment. So I want you to keep in mind that the regime of operation depends on some coupling parameters, which I'm gonna call uh, KIL, which is parameterizes the coupling between a localized charge in the interior of the quantum Hall liquid with the charge on the edge in the gapless mode circulating at the edge and KI, uh, which basically, if you want to think of it macroscopically, is sort of the edge stiffness. How much energy does it cost to add charge to that edge or move the edge? So if I'm building up a, a electrostatic model, these are the coupling constants that make all the difference to the observed behavior. And critically, uh, for the early experiments, theta anion is unobservable in the Coulomb dominated regime. You get a phi, uh, phase change, which is a multiple two pi, Okay, so this took quite some time, more recent theoretical developments, to fully understand this. And I want to emphasize that it was driven by experimental observations as well. We weren't the first group to ever think of trying to measure an interferometer, far from it. Early experiments tried to build the interferometer as described by Shimon, Kittleson, Wen, Sandy, all those guys. Now, here I'm taking some data from Charlie Marcus's group, which is representative um, and illustrates the point. They made two types of interferometers, what was be deemed a small one back in those days with an area of about two microns squared. And they put a top gate on top of their two deck. Okay. And the two, that gate has two functions. One, you can modulate the density in the region, but it also acts as a metallic screening layer. You know, to sort of screen out some of uh, the Coulomb potential. Now, the problem is it's kind of far away from their actual two day, but nevertheless, they measured this small device and no matter what they did, they always saw this Coulomb dominated behavior, the lines of constant uh, phase having positive slope going the wrong way. Now, they made a ginormous um, interferometer as well, 18 micron square area, again with the gate. And here they saw the first uh, signs of AB oscillations, lines of constant phase with negative slope. But what I want to emphasize and draw your attention to is the field scale. The field scale down here is half a Tesla. That's a very, very high filling factor. It's in what you might deem the Shimnikov the Haas region. The filling factor would be about 25 for this particular device. And the problem is, even though they were able to get in an AB regime, their coherence is very low. It's a huge area. They have mode circulating around the edge and the edge mode velocity is inversely proportional to magnetic field. And so by the time they would ever get to an interesting regime, they've lost the signal. Nevertheless, this, would, this illustrates what, if you happen to have an MBE in your lab, what to do. They put a gate, they made the device big, reduce the Coulomb uh, charging energy. They put a gate, again, to try to screen that out. Their problem was it's too, everything's too far away because they're doing lithography after the header structure has grown. So what we thought to do as well, why don't we build in our capacitor uh, plates in situ? Let's put them 
build metallic layers right into the header structure. So what we did was uh, grow a primary quantum well. This is where the two dag that I'm going to probe resides in this 30 nanometer quantum well. But during the growth, we introduced at close proximity, about 25 nanometers uh, below and above, additional quantum wells. And by choosing the band offsets and the well widths and the setback to the silicon dopants, there's a lot of details that's not necessarily so interesting, we can dictate what the charge distribution is among these three wells. And in this middle panel, I'm showing you the conduction band edge profile in the growth direction. That's like as you go down into the semiconductor layer, that's the red region, excuse me, the red line, and the blue uh, lines correspond to the charge density. And what you see is there's actually three two-dimensional electron gases in parallel. The one I'm interested in probing is actually the low in the center is actually the lowest density. I have two high density and different, it's important that there are different densities, two DEGs on either side. Why did I do this? Well, now I put that two DEG that I'm trying to suppress some of the long range Coulomb effects that give rise to the mesoscopic physics. I put it inside the pearl plate capacitor and it screens. Now you can do this and it makes the device fabrication and operation more complicated, but it's a really small price to pay for the benefit of getting into the AB regime. And even after you do a lot of device processing and may show you, uh, these are still in that central two day, very high quality, long need for path, correlation physics still dominates, okay? So we pay a price in complexity, but we basically do what Charlie was trying to do only better. And that's a good thing. I, don't get to say that very often. So mm -hmm. that <laughs> anyway, so that was a joke. So we have in, in cross section, here's what the device looks like. The ohmic contact goes to all three layers. You can't avoid that. But we use these gates to selectively deplete the two DEG surrounding the ohmics in the top screening layer and the bottom screening layer while maintaining contact through the primary quantum well. Okay. So we eliminate parallel conduction through the screening wells, but it's still, the, the screening wells are still populated. The, mes the tiny mesoscopic device is here and these gates are out in the flanks. It's like the subway system uh, going around the periphery of the, of the city. And we're able to dictate where we drive currents through. And this is something we also adapted from another set of experiments from Jim Eisenstein back in the nineties. He was interested in correlated bilayers and physics that you can get you know, exciton condensates and things like that. We modified his, his approach for, to apply to mesoscopic devices in three layers. But again, this is something that had been developed and we, we just modified for our purposes. Okay, so in the end of the day, the device doesn't look like a cartoon. It looks like this, kind of messy, it has lithography layers, but that's actual device and it goes in the bottom of a dilution refrigerator. Okay, so now I'm gonna just jump to the data. And the first thing I wanna show you is that we can take this device, put it at filling factor one, or sort of the limit of the integer states. That's one electron per flux quantum. And for, for us, this was kind of nice. It looks like the textbook, what Bert Halpern would say we should see. Lines of constant phase with negative slope. We can actually work out the lever arms and how the area changes with uh, gate voltage and the lithographic area and the effective electronic area coincide, so it's self-consistent. But what I want to point out here is this device has an effective area of about 0.75 micron square. Remember the previous smallest device that had been examined was two microns squared and had Coulomb dominated behavior. So what we've been able to do is shrink down the device, essentially make it 20 times smaller and still be in the AB regime. Why is that good? Well, a, a killer is loss of coherence along the, the interference path. By making it smaller, you know, we, we live with a finite edge state velocity. We have a uh, very large amplitude and robust interference. We can actually quantify the temperature dependence of that coherence. So putting these screening layers in allows us to shrink the device down so we have highly coherent uh, interference while maintaining the AB regime. It also has a secondary benefit 
for the experts that makes the confining potential at the edge sharper, which increases the edge velocity, which is a very powerful tool in um, for coherence, but also preventing edge state re, uh, reconstruction if you have soft potentials. Okay. Well, so, so, so uh, naively, I think when we shrink the size, the capacitance should go up. The Coulomb would be more pronounced. It, it, it is, unless you do something to compensate for that. And it, it would be, if I didn't have the, the two layers, they're screening, it would have an enormous charging energy. Exactly. It's only when I put the screening layers that I uh, suppress that charging energy because the electrons in the two layers can screen. No, I, I got that. You, you made a comment about the area. You said that the previous area was two micron and now this is smaller. But smaller makes it worse for the Coulomb. And then you compensate it. Exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's the wrong thing to do Good. if you don't have the... But my second question was the area estimate. How do you estimate the area when when we change the back edge, etc.? Would it be some deformation in the edge, etc., that the effective area changes? Yeah, we can calculate, and we know all the lever arms, and and there's a lot of stuff I can show you later. I'm not going to have time in this talk about uh, calibrating lever arms and how much the area changes in charge uh, by operating the thing actually as a quantum dot. Forget about interference on that B equals zero. I go into a tunneling regime and I know exactly, and I also know I can measure the velocity by doing, um, looking at differential conductance measurements, the finite bias and looking at what the, um, you'll, you'll develop in the differential conductance, a, a nodal structure. And those nodes occur as specific, that tells you exactly what the velocity is. And so you, you can do all of these calibrations that tell you, whether the lithographic area corresponds to the electronic area. And you, you also look at many different fractions and, and different integers and look for scaling. So there's lots of checks in order to say that we actually know what, what the area is. Okay. I can show you all that stuff later on. I just wouldn't have time here. Yes. Can you explain a bit more why the smaller area makes the combining potential sharper? No, it's not the smaller area that makes the sh it, it, it's actually the fact that you have a screen layer. And what's shown schematically here, it's like shining a light through a um, slit in a, in a screen. You know, typically the scale over which the density has to heal is set by the setback from the surface to the two day and the potential of like that. But now I have something that defines the potential 25 nanometers away and the gate just the, the fine gate, the QPC, just looks whoop, right down through. And what it actually does, if you do the electrostatics, it means that the density heals from the bulk to zero m over a much shorter distance, which means, implies the electric field is higher. So it, it's, it's not because it's small, it's because you have screening 25 nanometers away, okay? And the, the, the signature of that, I haven't gotten to it, is just this. This is what a QPC sweep looks like. Now I'm just pinching down the QPC. Okay, and I'm seeing it U equals one. And it's quantized, it's one unit of conductance, one quantum of conductance, and it stays that way until it drops to zero. And that's because the screening well in, in, uh, has a sharper density profile. For comparison, here is another QPC in a more standard structure from another you know, very big group, and they're doing lots of good stuff, the high bloom group, where it's at nu equals one, but this is what their typical QPC curve would look like, starting out at one. It's full of resonance, very slow, and you even see intermediate plateaus, which implies that there's a very gradual density change towards the edge. In fact, you may have an incompressible strip of one third liquid before you get to zero. That's a killer. This, this is bad news. And they say melting of interference and wrote a PRL about it. That's what you don't want. You want something that looks like this. Okay. So now uh, we just crank in this original device, crank up the magnetic field to one third. And lo and behold, we see lines of constant phase with negative slope. We work out what the periodicities are. We know what the lever arms, how much the area changes with gate voltage. And the change in periodicity from the integer 
to the fractional um, state, it's just you know the spacing in B and V implies that the charge is one third. If you you know subscribe to that formula that Burke and others wrote down, okay, and you know we know exactly what the periodicities are, the gate voltage, and we have scaling, and this is how we determine what's going on. Now this was nice. This was in two thousand nineteen. And it was the first observation of AB oscillations in the fractional regime, but the big prize is missing there. It, it just there doesn't look like there's any facelifts. Okay. And we're at a high magnetic field, there's a limited field range. But what happened is um, I I showed this data to Bert and Adi Stern, uh, Bert Rosano and Artie Stern. I said, well, it's kind of half good, half bad. We see the AB, but I don't see any facelifts. And this was at a meeting, and they, they went away. And then a, little bit, a few months later, a paper showed up on the archive, and, and they had kind of explained what was going on. So this was eventually published in PRL in 2020. So what's actually happening is there's a competition between the, uh, the Coulomb energy scales, between the energy cost to create a localized quasi-particle. You know, there's a gap, right? The fractional quantum Hall effect is an incompressible liquid. There's a gap find a gap for excitations, that energy costs and the electrostatic energy to keep new fixed. What we had done by these putting these screen layers in is make it easy for the system to relax by adding charge so that it doesn't change the filling factor. If you keep new exactly fixed at one third, as you make small perturbations in magnetic field or gate voltage, there's you don't add or change the quasi-particle number. And by, you know, we were so worried about the charging effects that we had kind of overcooked it. We made the screening too strong. So in, in Berndt and Adi's theory, in the center of the plateau, um, you know, that's called B0, you'll see these three finite period oscillations. But then as you move the magnetic field wide enough, eventually it becomes energetically unfavorable to keep adding charge without introduction of quasi-particles. So there'll be a, a transition at some critical field called BC, where the AB phase periodicity changes from three phi naught to phi naught. Once you get into what's called the compressible region, every time you introduce a uh, flux quantum, you introduce a quasi-particle, and there'll be a proliferation of that. And so you should, you know, basically what happens is if the chemical potential is sufficiently deep in the gap, there aren't density of states, you don't see anything but the three finite periodicity. As you perturb enough out into the flanks of the quantum Hall plateau, you will eventually cross a critical field where the chemical potential is a point where there's enough density of states, it's easy to create quasi-particles. And of course, that's symmetric, more or less about the, about the principal uh, center of the plateau. And they actually had a calculation of what this field range should be given the gap, the excitation gap, the filling factor, the fractional charge, and the capacitance, the charging energy. This is the E squared over C term, which we can measure. And basically what they said is you had no chance. You, you explored only a small range of magnetic field. It was energetically able to keep the filling factor fixed and the probability was very low for introducing quasi-particles. So of course we ran back to the lab, grew different samples, changed things. After learning this, what we did is we reduced the 2D density to put uh, one third lower magnetic field that gives us more operating range. And we reduce the area a bit even more to actually make the charging energy a little bit worse. We went back the other way. And here's the original data. So again, you see lines of constant phase with negative slope, but then you see this stuff that looks like glitches or noise and say, oh, that's crap. Well, we're gonna kind of try to convince you it's not, but so primarily negative slope lines of constant phase with this few discrete jumps in interference. Remember what Bert and others told us what the interference phase should do, it should change discontinuously. If you have change in the quasi-particle number in this particular data set, both delta B and delta V indicate one third charge. But now we look at these phase slips that occur. And if you actually do the analysis and consider, you know, what is the phase before and after across one of these transitions, you'll see that it's clustered around delta theta over two pi is minus one third, okay? 
So these phase slips, by doing the analysis and seeing how much phase is changed across one of those glitches, experimentally comes out to minus two pi times 0 0.31 plus or minus 0 0.04. And we thought that was pretty good compared to the theoretical expectation. Now this is reproducible, repeatable, it's not charge noise. Uh, uh, you know, in mesoscopic devices, you can always have fluctuators that change uh, the electronic configuration and therefore change transport. That is, these respond, all these things we see respond to the plunger gate and change the magnetic field and nothing else. If you want, I can show you all sorts of data. Now, that's good. So this is the what we consider the first uh, experimental demonstration of the anionic braiding statistics and, and a measure of the anionic uh, statistical angle at one third. But the theory, if you delve in, predicts more. And so there's a lot more we can do. So we can modify the device to probe anions in different regions. Now, in the center of the plateau is what's called the incompressible region. That's where there's a finite energy gap to add a quasi particle. But as I go out into the flanks, it's easier to add quasi-particles. And at some point, for every flux quantum I add, I will add a new quasi-particle. So if I look at interference over a broader range, I should see a transition in behavior. So in these newer devices, we're modified for this purpose, over a broader range of magnetic field, you see the central region, the incompressible region, but then a dramatic change in behavior out in the flanks at lower and higher field. Okay, so the central region, the delta B is three phi naught. If you go out into the flanks, the delta B corresponds to phi naught changes in the flux. Okay, and what we've done is we've dialed back. I've gone back more with more mesoscopic uh, charging energy and a, a more bulk edge coupling. There's a cost benefit analysis to be done. The benefit is if you zoom in, extremely sharp transitions. You know, here's the transition from the incompressible region to the compressible region. And you can see, you know, very sharp face slips. And then when we move into the compressible region, a complete change in the interference. It loses the primary magnetic field dependent slope. And we just see this breathing, these finite oscillations. And this is what one would expect and is indicative of anions. This doesn't happen if they're just electrons. The fact that we're still changing the quasi-particle number uh, in the compressible region gives rise to this particular form of interference. So the point of this is to say that, inter that the presence of anions is not just exemplified or, or seen in that one phase slip. It, um, it influences a number of transport features or interference features we see. And by designing the devices properly to take in account and modify these coupling constants, we can play with them. And that gives us further confidence that the devices are well behaved and we understand what's going on. So this allows, and why this system right now, at least, and maybe different in five years, is such a model system for actually making comparisons between uh, experiment and theory. It's well behaved so that we can actually, we did this by design and you can make quantitative comparisons. So just to show you, you know, this is a small device. <clears throat> if I look at the central incompressible region, it's 480 millitesla. Theory would tell me, Adi and Stern would tell me, it's supposed to be 530, eh, not so bad. <laughs> then you move, out into the compressible regions and we see exactly the behavior we expect, it, the change to the finite periodicity. If I now, because I've elevated the, the energy scales a bit by making it smaller, I can now look at the temperature dependence. And if I look at the temperature dependence, now up at 90 millikelvin, it looks like my original data at lower temperature. We see things rounded off and in the compressible regions, the you know, the really nice beating effect is, is lost. It's, we're losing coherence out in, in those re regions as a function of temperature. If you look at the periodicities, you know, you look at the FFTs, you can see that, you know, there's uh, a specific frequency uh, at nu equals one in 
the on the high field side, and then at as we raise the temperature, it's lost. So everything uh, sort of makes sense. So I'm going to try to finish up now. I, I'm, there's a lot of theory questions I can't answer. So, um, what I want to tell you in a, in two minutes is that this isn't just like, wow, well, you know, there's some sort of vague correspondence between what's an experiment and theory. There are well defined coupling constants. And with mesoscopic devices, doing device physics, you can measure and extract the coupling constants. And then there's no Fitting, you know, you you extract what a coupling constant is, and it goes into your formula for the phase. But there's no uh, free parameters, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the theorists have worked out what the energetics should be. You know, there's a coupling constant, the edge stiffness I told you about Ki, and there's the coupling between the localized quasi particles and the edge modes. That's Kil. There's Kl, but in the dilute mode, it doesn't really matter. So you can write down an energy function depending on these coupling constants and the densities, the change in densities, okay? Now, there's a modified equation for the interference phase. It looks sort of heinous and complicated, but it's really not. It's just scaling things by the ratio of these coupling constants and the change in filling factor. And these fill, what I'm going to try to demonstrate is that you can extract those couplings from experiment. So let's look at Compressible versus incompressible at just the boring old integer state. In the central region, the, the, the B field period is 28 millitesla, and in the flanks, it's 20 and 22. And you can just look at the FFPs. Now, if you just do the math, the, the change in the magnetic field period in the incompressible region, why this is 28 and not 21, is given by the ratio of these coupling constants, KIL, KI. So just by scaling, oops, I'm running out of batteries, the ratio of periods, you can extract what the ratio of KIL to KI is, and it's 0.25 in this particular device, which is a moderate amount of bulk edge coupling. Not so severe that we can't see anions, but enough that it's discernible in the experiments. Okay, that's just one way. We can also do it more microscopic topically by operating our device as a quantum dot. We can say, forget about interference. I'm back at B equals zero. I can pinch it off, look at Coulomb, Coulomb blockade spectroscopy to extract energy scales. I can also look at um, finite bias differential conductance measurements to extract the edge state velocity. And these uh, measurements allow us to extract the coupling constants that go into the modify, modification of the phase that's observed in the experiment to the statistical angle. And if you do that in this device where we added more bulk edge coupling, the average phase jumps in the incompressible region is not minus 0.33 or you know, divided by 2 pi. It's minus 0.24. It's smaller. That's what's measured as the interference phase. But if you look at the formulas from BERT et al., it's modified by this ratio of couplings. And if you put those measured couplings, not this is not a fit like, okay, let's try to figure out what it should be. You put them in from the measurement, the anionic phase comes back out to 0.33. Spot on. Different device, different material, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So we understand how the devices work. And we can do a lot of consistency checks to make sure that the physics we're talking about is actually manifest in the devices. Okay, and I'm just showing you that more. Just to finish up, what's next? What can we do? Well, obviously, we want to do this for more complex fractions, ones with multiple edge modes, ones where it's not just the filling factor equals the charge <laughs> equals the statistics, the hierarchy states, even two-fifths, is a challenge. And late last year, we were able to do that, measure the statistical phase and effective charge at two fifths, where the effective charge is one fifth, and the angle is basically minus four pi over five. There are a lot of challenges. If I had time for a second talk, I tell you why that's challenging. Just take my word for it. But nonetheless, that's actually happened, and we've measured it in a different system, which bodes well for 
first, from my perspective, for the general applicability of the technique. It's not a one trick pony at one third. And maybe it'll be useful in other material systems and other settings to, to general technique, which would be really cool. And I think it already is showing that in graphene. Okay, just to give you a sense that the two fifths is not just one third of a slightly smaller field. It's a much more fragile state and lots of interesting physics. Uh, you won't have time, but we did do the analysis. I'm running out. But again, the same methodology of really calibrating the device and extracting the coupling constants and then comparing to theoretical expectations uh, is a good self-consistency check. And we were able to measure the phase at one third, two fifths. Now what's next? Well, obviously we want to do it at bypass. I want to beat Andre Young because <laughs> he has a pretty good chance of measuring it in graphene for the half filling states. The gaps are bigger and you know, so maybe graphene is the, prop, the proper venue for doing this, but I'm still going to give it a, a try uh, in gallium arsenide. We also want better understanding of tunneling uh, at the QPCs. Long ago, uh, Zhao Gang Wen proposed that the chiral edge modes are actually chiral Luttinger liquids and then should have uh, specific scaling properties. That has not been demonstrated uh, very well in gallium arsenide to date, and we think these new structures may help. Uh, there's been some claims of electron pairing in the integer regime for states. Uh, we are currently doing experiments that will most likely disprove uh, that and show that there's no electron pairing. There's entropy measurements, so other ways to get at the statistics of five halves, looking at the ground state degeneracy, the entropy associated with that, and conductance measurements of interfaces between five halves and integer filling. So the, there's enough here to occupy me until I retire with one, one you know, half my job here. And uh, I think all of this will be very useful for all these new materials as they develop, uh, sort of setting uh, a, a methodology for, as the materials develop, what could be done to probe fractionalized uh, excitations in, in, in condensed matter systems. So thank you for your attention. Right. Before we get to questions, I just to, I, I had an unfinished business when I introduced, uh, there's P for graduate students and postdocs at four with the speaker in the usual place, which I think is 2117. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're good. All right, questions. Uh, I have a name. Uh, Question. So, can, uh, uh, can, can, can you measure the out, out of relation function of the QPC signal? And uh, uh, if, if yes, can you also measure the cross correlation? Yeah, I, so we are, others can. Of course, Marty Heibloom can, can do that. I am, I just put in a, pur a purchase order for a new fridge where I am going to set up to do noise measurements. We have multiple low temperature amplifiers to measure properties just like you're saying. So. You, the answer is yes, there's information to be got. Had. Uh, you know, the, the study of noise and the fractional edges is complicated. It hasn't been a super clean story over the years, but there is, of course, um, more information to be learned by looking at the at the at both the cross correlations and the autocorrelations in noise. So what do you ex uh, expect to have when you have the phase sleep Oh, um, well, there are papers out from, uh, from the Sacle group where they would argue that the presence of the anions is uh, bear, the, the information about the statistics is contained in the cross correlations. And there's this very elaborate theory that, you know, maybe it's a, over my head, but where uh, they talk about time domain braiding, which uh, is reflected in the cross correlations. And basically the, the fact that there are anions and um, there are like higher order processes where, uh, you know, I don't completely understand it, where a, a particle comes in and is sort of resonant in that region for a while, and another one comes through, that is an effect uh, operating in time, not in space. And that is reflected in the, in the cross correlations. So, 
yeah, there's lots to do. And they they have published papers, the uh Wendell Ferv and and Glotley and um and Frederick Pierre, you know, they're they're really uh jocks in uh, electron optics and they have some nice results. I'm hoping that but they don't have the structures that we do. They're not looking at the same structure. So uh yeah, we'll we'll see what we get. But there are already experiments. I want to give them credit. They've they they worked hard at this, and there are indications that the anionic part is reflected in the cross correlation. Yes. Has two thirds been shown? Hmm? U equals two thirds. Has that been shown? Um how about the what chart? What, what was the question? No, the filling two thirds. Yeah. Rates, has that been checked? The fractional statistics of it? Yeah, we've spent some time. We it's it's trickier to get stable um, so far, but it's on the the reason, of course, we want to do it is because that's a simple case where you can have counter propagating modes, and we published a paper last year in PRL looking at. Um, conductance quantization, just in the QPC, it's not the interference signal, and saw evidence that we actually have a counter-propagating one-third mode and a downstream one mode um, by partitioning the edges. The interference so far has been relatively weak. I don't have anything with me to say, but it's certainly on the agenda. So, you know, if, if I were going to do anything still in the lowest Landau level, it would be the particle hole symmetric state. It would be two-thirds. My aim right now is because everyone else is rushing for and graphene is the half filling. I don't want to end Andrea the win, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But two-thirds is an interesting state. And that's one where all this edge state reconstruction dynamics really matters. Yeah. And that's where I think our structures are important because you know, this is the first time that I'm aware of where that intermediate half quantum plateau was observed, which says that it's somewhat resilient to reconstruction. So, yeah, yeah, to any other yeah, 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 I think yeah. question. So, mentioned about extracting some non universal data, such as the edge velocity, we have we edge rank. How good is that consistent with the estimation of the scale, uh, estimation of scale and commercial data quantum form from the combining potential, such as TUOP? Sorry, I, I'm hard of hearing. I, I apologize. But what exactly was the question? What is the meat of the question? So you, you, you mentioned that you can extract some non-universal data of the edge states, right? The edge velocity. You can measure the velocity, yes. You mentioned about how you measure the edge velocity from experiments. You can extract the data, right? Yes. So how good is that data compared with some uh, theoretical estimation, such as the E over B, like from the combining potential? It's always... Uh, E or B. It, it depends on how uh, exact uh, calculation you want to compare it to. Um, what I can say is that in the simplest, you know, some sort of calculation that we could do as experimentalists using, you know, something like uh, Next Nano and modification software, the velocity is always lower than you would naively expect. So how that's renormalized in detail, I don't have a great answer to yet. So the, but the functional form, we had a paper on this in 2018, which first motivated us to try, where we tried to estimate uh, numerically in the sort of, you know, crude calculation that we could do, um, what the form of the velocity should look like. And qualitatively, our velocity estimation as a function of filling factor and field does agree I mean, with the functional form, whether there's an overall scaling factor uh, that renormalizes it down a little bit is still I'm not completely sure of. So, Bill, you're the last question, I guess. Uh, what would be the smoking gun that would show that five house was not a field? Okay. Um, 
I've been involved. <laughs> There's no such thing as a smoking gun experiment. <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> and no one should. Uh, well, as as I said it, I was sort of wondering: Do modern guns actually smoke? I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 they do. <laughs> they do, but you, that that term has a negative connotation in condensed matter physics these days. Um, and I would never be presumptuous enough to say that this is it. Now, in for non-abelian case, there are very clear and distinct predictions, and that the interference depends on the pack. If you have a set of E over four quasi particles, they'll have, uh, you know, they'll share very loose terms of Majorana and there'll be a specific parity. And whether you see interference or not depends on the parity of that state. So what Halperin and Stern and what, you know, said back in 2005, 2006, is that you'll go from regions of seeing interference to complete loss of interference when you change the quasi particle, the content of the inner region. So if you wanted to say, but it's more complicated because of course there's an abelian component as well. And so the patterns that you'll see be complicated. But if you were gonna say, can I distinguish at five has between abelian and non-abelian, certainly this disappearance and reemergence of interference at all is a very clear prediction. So if, if this will not be one of the numerics where you say, well, you know, the statistical angle is a little bit different. It, it's supposed to be qualitatively different because of the, you know, the, as you braid around, uh, that in, can change the parity of the, of the uh, quasi particle pair. It'll be very hard. The, the, the problem is, if I guess, is everything depends on a gap, right? Everything's protected only insofar as there is a gap. And these gaps, uh, certainly for the non-abelian states, are smaller. So one third, I have several Kelvin of excitation gap. At five halves, I have at most uh, realistically half a Kelvin, okay? And so that's a, really the issue. Everything's softened because of this. Now that's where graphene has a chance. Well, why is that a problem when you if you work at ten? No one's told. Well, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, there can still be. Now the question of what the electron temperature is uh, is a different uh, question. Also. What I mean by gap, we're, we're talking about mesoscopic gap. So when I say the gap is half a Kelvin, what I mean is sort of a, uh, in some sense, a thermodynamic limit. I have a large sample. I measure activated transport with leads well separated. Now I have a little puddle, about a micron of liquid where I'm also changing the density fairly rapidly because I have all these gates. You know, there, uh, There's a lot that can go wrong. And I'm just saying, you have a factor of 10 reduction in, in the fundamental gap. And so stabilizing um, the five halves in a small region, so it's truly incompressible, like there's no conduction through the, gap, you know, the central region is a uh, challenge. We'll see, we'll see. And effectively getting the electrons, to, the best we've done so far is about 18 millikelvin electron temperature in the mesoscopic device. That's a different thing than having a big sample with big leads. I'm saying if you have a little thing, just it's weakly coupled and there's just two reservoirs, what you actually end up doing is measuring the electron temperature, the Fermi function of the reservoirs. And we can get those to, by doing Coulomb blockade thermometry, about 18 millikelvin. Yeah, it just, it just and there's multiple edge modes <laughs> and there's neutral modes and neutral modes can decohere, right? The, there's new Carl neutral modes. Yeah. <laughs> Just hard. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, we'll thank Mike for an awesome talk. Yeah. <laughs>